And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. Ah, goodness. Ain't no wonder animals love red clover, horses and cows and goats and sheep. and That stuff smells so good. Some people probably think I'm crazy, but and I might be just a little bit. <laughs> That's good. Take this flower. This little clover, red clover flower. And this is something we used to do as kids when we were helping um, some of our relatives in the, the hay fields or we were working in the gardens or whatever. We would take, if you found a, a red flowering red clover, take the, the just pick the, the flower off of it. We'd take it and put it in our lip like, like skull. And, and uh, actually go through the day picking it and putting a fresh one in. And just kind of, you know, kind of suck on it and get the flavors out of it. You wouldn't believe how sweet and what a pleasant taste that has. There ain't no wonder honeybees, I can't hardly talk with that in my mouth. No wonder honeybees are all over it. That stuff's sweet. And it actually tastes good. I don't know, maybe if you consume much of it, it might make you sick, I don't know. But So don't do what I do when it comes to eating stuff like this. <laughs> I don't want you to get sick. But as young boys, we walk around that stuff in our jaw, packed between our, our gum and our, and our cheek. We'd walk around with that in our cheek like that all day. Uh, you know, chewing on it and sucking on it, getting the juices and the sweetness out of it. So, don't do what I do, <laughs> as far as that goes. Howdy folks, Darren back with you here at Cross Timbers Farm. Welcome to 8th Day Chronicles, and welcome back to part two of our test plot basics for quality hay for the small scale farmer. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we're in a very unsettled weather pattern here in late July in Western North Carolina. We've had uh, the threat and the actual occurrence of evening thunderstorms really hit and miss. Uh, we've got, uh, we're ready to cut our test plot hay, but the weather is just not cooperating. Um, we can talk about when to cut your hay, as in the growth stage of that hay, but if the weather's not conductive, <laughs> you're just at the mercy of it. Uh, our test plot hay, as you can see behind me, uh, the height of it, if you're just going purely by height, which we do not we do not do, to an extent your height determines some things, like when the boot stage is, it's gonna, your boot stage is not gonna be when it's that tall, you know, but you look at your, you look at your, your hay, your cool season grasses and your legumes, and they'll tell you when to cut your hay. Uh, not a calendar, or anything else and our this test plot is is ready to cut most of our orchard grass is uh, right in the boot stage we got some you can see a few seed heads behind me we've got some that's a a little bit ahead of the rest but most of it is is prime and it'll be prime for uh, a little bit longer but not a whole lot we need to get it cut um, but um, the good Lord's in control of the weather and we can't cut this hay in the rain and 
have it rain on it the next day and then the next day and then the next day. You know what I'm saying. Uh, the hay would be ruined and really be good for nothing but, you know, to sell it for mulch. This is too high quality of hay to me to be sold for mulch. So we're going to wait till uh, the weather will let us cut it. So in any event, thanks for being back with us on part two of our test plot basics. Uh, today we're going to dive into your arch enemy as I related to the first, first part one of this series. Weeds. Weeds, weeds, weeds. Uh, weeds are your arch enemy when it comes to hay. And let's go ahead and assume you have uh, laid out your test plot, where you want your test plot to be. You've collected soil samples. You got those results back from the lab and you've read the analysis of your soil. You know what it's lacking, you know what it needs, you know what it's good in. And a, a disclaimer up front, every area of the country is different in a lot of ways. When it comes to quality hay and what to do with your soil, and things of that nature. This is not a one size fits all. I'm going to provide you with what my area dictates. Your mileage may vary. And once again, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick disclaimer. Uh, it's very cloudy today. We had rain this morning and the, the little bitty black gnats are everywhere. So Please pardon me doing like this, swatting at gnats. They're all over the place. I do have me a pack of cigars that uh, I may have to just light one up and lay it here somewhere to let the smoke blow through to keep these demon gnats at bay for a little while. Uh, so that's out of the way. So your mileage may vary. Um, certain types of cool season grasses, warm season grasses, your native grasses, your legumes, things in your test plot could vary greatly from mine. So bear that in mind through this whole series, you need to apply, you can take some of these tidbits and apply it to your area in one way, shape or another to fit your own unique circumstance. Okay, here in our area, weeds are a major concern. I, like I alluded to in the first part, I've seen people bailing, I'm just gonna say I've seen people bailing, mowing and bailing a field of weeds. Super low quality hay. Weeds, weeds are something that will separate your hay from the rest. They may be some areas of the country that weeds are not, that's not really that big of a deal for you. But here in my area, weeds are a year round constant battle. So we're going to address that. And I think in most places in the south, southeast at least, Weeds are a problem. Uh, so we're gonna, I alluded to last week, a resource, Weeds of the South. This book is a fantastic resource, fantastic. Highly encourage you to look into this book. These books can be purchased off Amazon. This book, uh, let's go ahead and give credits for it. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the names. The authors, and on the back you can see uh, the credits. All right, we got that out of the way. Highly recommended. Okay, uh, 
let's, let's assume you've, you've got your test plot marked and laid out. You have done, went by your local ag extension office and picked up soil sample kits, sent those off, got your analysis back. And you've looked at what your, your soil is uh, lacking or is really good in. Uh, do you need to lime? Does your, does your test plot, is it lacking in phosphorus, calcium, zinc, copper? Uh, your soil analysis will tell you that. Have you got out in your test plot and, and raked around and looked around before you done anything? Get out there and take an inventory. How, how's your weed load? What kind of desirable grass legumes do you already have in your hay plot in your test plot uh, is there life in your test plot and down in the in the soil and the sod take some time get you a little shovel you can take this little garden shovel and you can go around and make you just rake around and and just take an inventory of your sod and your soil see what kind of biomass you have there has it been bush hogged? Has it had animal traffic on it? When you're doing an inventory of your test plot, you need to really, it wouldn't even hurt to carry your little notepad with you. Document what you got, what you're working with. Uh, your weeds, document those weeds. What, it, what type of weeds are you dealing with? There's some weeds that I've found here in my area that are a whole lot harder to deal with than others then how are you going to uh, attack those weeds weed control is a long term endeavor for your hay crop it's not you're not going to be battling these weeds just at start up when you start your test plot in your main hay fields Weed control is a year-round, every year battle. And go ahead and prepare yourself for that. Uh, you're not gonna go out into your test plot in the spring and mow and clip and then have to re you know, resort to some spraying and think you're done. Oh, I'm good for the rest of the year. No, you're not you're going to be in for a rude awakening. They are early spring weeds. There's late spring weeds that'll, that'll start growing. There's midsummer weeds. There's late summer weeds. There's fall weeds. You'll spray in the spring and they'll all be gone. And a couple months later, a whole different variety of weeds you'll see start rearing their ugly heads, popping up. Mowing. For weed control bush hogging your test plot let's let's you're you're looking at not really producing much results off your test plot for let's just say two years is your goal for that first two years or three years that first two years you're going to be continually mowing bush hogging Clipping, when those weeds come up, you do not want them to go to seed head. You're gonna go through and clip them off. You're gonna go through and bush hog. And that biomass is gonna end up down in your sod, which is a good thing. It's gonna start creating life in your sod, in your soil. Um, You know, like I said earlier, this is something that has to be addressed at varying times of the year. You're going to be clipping and bush hogging your test plot quite often uh, to get those weeds under control. Because like I said, you got one group of weeds that's going to come up in the spring, buttercup, things of that nature. Later in the summer, you're going to have horse nettle, goldenrod, different things start rearing their ugly head. You're going to be mowing, bush hogging, and clipping again. For weed control, bush hogging and 
clipping is a very good technique. You're, what you're doing, as soon as those weeds get up just high enough to clear most of your grass before they seed. Now, some weeds grow really tall, like iron weed and things. Some, some weeds grow really close to the ground. You're gonna have to gauge the weeds that you have and the height you need to cut. Uh, you need to clip and bush hog those weeds Man, the gnats are terrible. Y'all have to excuse me. You're gonna have to clip and mow those weeds before they develop seed. That is a very effective way at controlling your weed growth. Bear in mind, there is some weeds, at least in our area, that your very best efforts of mow, bush hogging, mowing, clipping, will keep them at a certain level and even year after year seems to never eliminate them. There are some weeds that we have that are very problematic that mowing and weed eating uh, short of just every two or three weeks going through and just about scalping that test plot down to the dirt. Um, Man, they rear their ugly head. And they just are almost impossible, it seems like, to get rid of. It's like they've got a, an iron wheel to live. Uh, boy, wouldn't it be nice if some of our uh, cool season grasses was that way. <laughs> uh, there seem to be a lot more finicky to a degree than the weeds. Um, Two weeds that we constantly battle here on our farm that clipping and bush hogging over the years has really seemed to have no effect on, and that is number one arch enemy we have here is horse nettle. Horse nettle here on our farm is like a nemesis from Hades. Our second weed that uh, just persists and persists and persists and you're constantly going into the 12th round with is clammy ground cherry. We have, and both clammy ground cherry, that and horse nettle are both a midsummer to late summer weed for us. During the spring, we don't deal with them. Our first cutting of hay, we're not dealing with those two weeds really at all. We're dealing with buttercup and some plantain and some other stuff. The good news is, I'm not the type of farmer that immediately, when I start seeing weeds, I look at them and go, okay, it's time to spray. For us here on our farm, spraying is our last resort. It's our last option. We have mowed and mowed and mowed and seen very little results on that particular weed. Now the mowing may be, and clipping may be really effective on some other weeds, but if you've got a, a couple of other particular weeds that it's not, then we result back to uh, the heavy artillery and it's time to spray. And I feel like spraying a lot of times with some circles has a bad rap. And it's from overuse and using really harsh chemicals that stay in your ground for years and years and years and I get all that. Do your research. Find the very least invasive chemical spray that you can use. And even then, use the minimal amount you have to. That's what we do here. Uh, if we have resorted to using spray for weed control, then we go with the very, what's the word I'm looking for? unharsh maybe 
quickly dissolving, uh, minimal lasting in the soil spray chemical that we can use. And we mix that chemical in our sprayer. Usually you'll get a, a range, you know, you need to use two to three ounces per gallon or I'm just making that up, but whatever range you have there, we use the very minimum. And we've had good luck with it. We've had really good luck with our spray. Um, it's had very little effect on anything other than our weeds. I'm convinced of that. So don't be afraid of chemical sprays. Um, if, if you have hay customers or someone that's concerned that your hay had some spray in it, now if they're taking that hay and using it for mulch or whatever on their vegetable garden, you need, you need to tell them. Everybody that takes hay off your property, if that hay's been sprayed, you need to inform them that hay has been sprayed. Okay, but a lot of people are, I'm trying to think of the right way to word this to not be offensive, but too many people has listened to someone on a soapbox screaming and yelling, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Everything needs to be organic. You need to be uh, an organic farm. You need to be doing this, doing that, which I've got nothing against, but sometimes that's not enough. Okay, I'm gonna give one example of that. A couple years ago, we went to look at a couple of dairy goats from a real nice couple. They were, they were fantastic. They were moving away from dairy goats and going into uh, just a homestead. They were gonna buy a couple of Jersey cows. Already had one, I think, and was maybe looking at another one. We went and looked at those those dairy goats. We were quite experienced with dairy goats. Soon as we approached those goats, I knew they were they had a parasite problem. Just from didn't even have to handle them. As soon as I walked out into the pasture and looked at them at a at a distance of 20, 30 yards where I could see them decently and then got up close to them and looked at them. Uh, I done the FAMACHA score, looked at them once I got up to them. They had quite a heavy parasite load. I questioned the owners about that parasite load. And they informed us that they were doing organic, natural deworming, uh, using DE and using uh, different things to eat like pine and things in their, their, their diet to control those internal parasites. I told the lady, I agree with that wholeheartedly. That's a maintenance, that's something you do all the time. But once those parasites have jumped over the proverbial fence and made their way into the fort, at that point you need to start seriously considering some chemical dewormer. And I didn't want to be insulted or nothing like that, but I strongly encouraged her to chemically deworm those goats that they were in a danger zone. They were had a very heavy parasite load. This couple were very adamant that they were gonna treat these goats holistically, organically, with natural deworming methods. And I strongly suggested to her and him that they should consider chemical dewormers at this point, that I totally agreed with natural ways, but there comes a point where those parasites have, like I said a minute ago, jumped the proverbial fence somehow and infected those animals, got into the fort, 
and these animals were in a danger zone, quite serious danger zone. And that was not, I'm not gonna say not well accepted. They, they were very polite and I tried to be as polite as I could, but I was really worried about those animals because they were quality animals. Their, their bloodlines and lineages were, were top shelf. And um, no way was I buying those animals at that point. But if those animals were covered and were vet checked and healthy, then I might be interested to come back. Long story short, about a week later, received messages from the owners that both those animals passed away. They uh, died from heavy parasite load. Okay, what does all that mean? What am I getting at? Your, your weed load in your field, that is a very good analogy, al analogy. How do you say that? Analogy, analogy. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's a very good comparison to your, to, to your hay field and your weed load. I believe in going through first and clipping that, that, those weeds. I believe in bush hogging those weeds first, but you need to, to be objective and look at your hay test plot. Now your weed load might not be that bad and uh, occasional clippings and uh, bush hogging solve your problem, yay. If you're like we were, that that only done so much, and the uh, buttercup and um, horse nettle and clammy ground cherry and plantain was, I mean, they had their fists up and they were duking it out with me. That's the time you go back to your 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 corner and your. Uh, trainer tells you it's time to pull out uh, the heavy artillery. These weeds are here to fight and your clipping and bush hogging has knocked some of that crowd off but you've still got a few of them that's still standing there with their dukes up and you're going to have to do something unless you want to be bailing subpar hay. Um, and without some control, those weeds will take over. Okay, another, another thing, that's why your soil sample is so important. Your soil sample will tell you, for lack of a better term, put this all in layman's terms, how rich or how poor your dirt is. And those weeds are gonna love to move into that, that poor dirt area. Next thing is seeding. Okay, seeding is important to your weed control. You want your stand of good grasses to get as thick as they can get. Mighty orchard grass. If I can get my orchard grass to thriving so good and so thick and covering every, every place in my test plot thickly, this orchard grass will pretty soon start crowding out your weeds. It helps, helps tremendously. So how do we do that? Okay, we've bush hogged, we've clipped, we've mowed, we have uh, done spraying, whatever we can do. And we've still got some weeds. Yes, you're probably still gonna have some. What do you do next? Next thing is seeding. What kind of grasses do you want in your hay? A lot of this is, is area dependent. I've got real good friends that grow Bermuda grass 
uh, at a lower elevation than we are. They do, it makes fantastic hay. We have folks that bail uh, a lot of fescue, a lot of orchard grass, a lot of timothy. And you need to decide what you want in your hay. Once you've made that decision, then it comes time to start seeding, okay? This is after your soil samples, after you've done weed control for some time before you start seeding. Then you're gonna start your seeding, okay? Uh, frost seeding. This past year was the first time we did frost seeding. And what frost seeding is, is you go to your, your area and your test plot and you just broadcast seed out onto your test plot and cross your fingers and hope that it reaches the soil and germinates. No. Okay, what frost seeding is, before I get into what it is, let's, let me say this. I know folks that have done frost seeding that told me they wouldn't do it again. It was a waste of their time. I've heard other people say, frost seeding done fantastic. I done a lot of research on frost seeding before we frost seeded this test plot last year. And I'm happy to say our frost seeding results were fantastic. Were they 100%? No. Were they 90%? No. I would say that the results of our frost seeding was about 70%, 70 to 75%. That's good. That's very good. Timing is everything when it comes to frost seeding. The weather will dictate when you frost seed. If you go out into your field right now or in December when you're in a two-week span of zero degree weather, you're not going to have that good results. Timing, I can't stress this enough, timing is everything when it comes to frost seeding. You need to watch the weather really, really close. When you get in your forecast and the weather happens, you get a period of several days in a row or a week where you're gonna have freezing temperatures at night and warming up into the 40s or 50s during the day, that's when you need to be frost seeding. You're depending on that ground, that soil, to freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw. What that does, it allows that seed to get good contact into that soil by the freezing and thawing of that dirt, opening and closing, so to speak, moving to allow those seeds to penetrate into that soil and germinate. I've heard people say to frost seed when it snows, and I would disagree with that. If you throw your seed on top of snow, all that is is bait for your local songbird population and rabbits and everything else. If you throw it under just before it snows, and you're expecting several inches of ground covering snow, not a good idea either. That snow actually insulates the ground. Um, it needs to be on, uh, what I say dry ground, I mean visible. It needs to be on visible ground, dry ground, and it needs to be when the temperature is going to be dipping down at night well below freezing, in the, preferably in the 20s. And during the day, you're gonna get up into at least the 40s. Or sometimes, I've even seen it here in the mountains warmer than that sometimes. You'll get 20 at night and 50 during the day. That is prime time to be frost seeding. I think a lot of folks, even with no-till drill or something like that, your, your germination rate's not gonna be 100%. I've never seen or heard of that. Last year we did our frost seeding. We watched the weather and when it came, the weather forecast looked perfect. We frost seeded and we had great results. 
very happy with it. Now, that being said, if you can, if you own a no-till drill or you have some family that has no-till drill, uh, at that point you can seed. I recommend fall seeding. That's just me. I prefer fall seeding. Uh, you can you could seed any time through the winter in the spring. No-till drill is a fantastic option if if you have one or access to one. If you don't, there is some county extension offices that own some of this equipment and they'll rent it to you. If you can afford the rental fees and all that stuff and have the equipment to do it, no-till drill is fantastic. However, do not overlook frost seeding. Frost seeding is gonna be a lot more tedious. It's gotta be done exactly the right time. And you probably are not going to have as high success rate uh, in germination as you would with a no-till drill, but you're still going to have pretty good results for very, very minimal cost input for your farm. That's why I t another reason you need a test plot. You can do your frost seeding and the following spring go, wow, this, is work this frost seeding worked great. We need to carry that on over to our main hay field. Or rats. The frost seeding didn't do that good. I don't know if I want to carry that on over, if I want to go with a no-till drill. And, and bear in mind, the frost seeding sometimes can de could depend on some of your soil conditions. Your weed load and your test plot, and your when I say test plot, we're referring to your hay fields and everything, but your weed load is going to garner more attention from you than almost anything else you do. Um, we covered kind of the type of grasses for your area. In my area, orchard is king. Orchard grass is hardy. It's uh, pretty cold resistant through the winter. It is, uh, regrowth is good. Orchard grass, quality orchard grass is high in nutritional value. Um, the animals absolutely love it. I am not a Timothy fan. Uh, we attempted some Timothy and I've never really grown any cool season grasses for hay that was as fickle as Timothy. Timothy, very soft, very palatable to the animals. They like it, however, as a hay producer, to me, your mileage may vary. For my soil conditions, my area, all the totality of the circumstances, Timothy was not a viable option for us. We found that out real fast. Timothy, one year you'll have a beautiful stand. It looks great. And the next year you're out in your hay field scratching your head going, where'd my Timothy grass go? It's gone. It did not uh, regrow. It's, uh, for this area, it's finicky. It's too finicky. We dropped the Timothy from our, our portfolio. Uh, we go with the orchard uh, and tall fescue and red clovers to combat that end of fight. And some white clover, a little Dino clover. We have plenty of that in our hay too. Uh, the clovers, orchard grass, and fescue. We found that works. We've got some native grasses too. Um, fertilizer. Look at your soil sample analysis. Uh, spreading manure. We've done a lot of that. Um, we actually done most of it by hand. We would roll wheelbarrow loads out of the barn stalls from the goats, out of the chicken coops, out of the chicken lots, and spread it on our hay field. It, natural fertilizers, I'm gonna go back to what I talked about with deworming those goats with holistic, natural, organic dewormers and chemical depending on your soil sample. 
all this that's why soil sample is so important go back to your soil sample look at this red clover super power plant isn't that a nice one that's just one stem of red clover in our test plot and we've got some that's a lot leafier than this one I just randomly grabbed this one there's some of them it's a whole lot leafier um, but that's still a pretty good representation animals go nuts over this stuff they love it it'll combat the endophytes in your tall fescue if you have endophyte fescue so uh weeds it's a constant battle getting your weeds under control and having the cleanest hay you can possibly have will separate you from most hay producers in your area. I'm, conv I'm almost convinced of that. Uh, last first part I alluded to some uh, examples of some really trashy, weedy, dirty hay. Well, I don't even know if I'd call it hay. Weedy, dirty, trashy bales of something. Um, finding quality hay in your area um, when people that does not grow their own hay but they take exceptional care of their their horses and their dairy animals and their cattle and their sheep when they sample your hay and see the high quality of that hay they'll be back they'll, they'll be back with a trailer to, to load up and you'll have a customer as long as you produce that good hay. So, thanks for being with us here for our part two on our test plot basics. And weeds is your number one enemy. You will be battling weeds. Don't, like I said earlier, don't think you're gonna go through for one season and uh, combat your weeds, go to battle with them, and uh, do your mowing, clipping, bush hogging, spraying if necessary, and you're done. Uh, it's, if, if you have that, uh, that outlook toward it, you, the weeds will defeat you. Uh, you've got to stay on the weeds every year. Uh, no matter if you're, you've got a well-established hay field that's been there for three or four years, you're still battling those weeds. Show me a producer that produces high-quality hay year after year, and I'll show you a guy or gal that knows their weeds and has put on the boxing gloves and went to war with them. Uh, that's what it takes. So, um, stay with us. Part three will be coming up soon. Uh, we're going to dive into the winds. Uh, I had originally planned on the winds to be part two, but then we, I realized we need to address the weed situation first. Um, we'll dive into the winds of when to seed. We did a little of that in this one, when to frost seed. Um, we'll dive into some when to uh, cut your hay. Once you have an established stand, when you need to cut that hay for quality hay, when you need to bale it, uh, at what moisture content, things of that nature. We'll dive into more of the whens in part three. Thank you for being with us here at the farm in this little mini series on test plot basics. We really appreciate you stopping by the, the channel here with us. And if you haven't, we really appreciate it if you'd subscribe to our channel. We've got a lot of views here on our channel, but the subscriber rate is lacking, which shows that there's a lot, lot, lot of people watching and not subscribing. So uh, if you enjoy our content and you like coming out on the farm here with us, um, We'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. It encourages us to keep making videos. And drop some comments. We will interact with you. Um, I know some channels get so big that, or, or some of the smaller ones, it doesn't really matter, I guess. 
but a lot of channels won't interact with their commenters and their subscribers and uh, you you look at some of the videos and that there's there's several comments and no answers to anything we will uh, as time allows we will interact with you and that lets us get to know you a little bit and we like to consider you friends uh, we can become acquaintances through the comments and I'd really appreciate that uh, uh, a man that wants to have friends must show himself friendly and uh, the more friends you have the richer you are so we'd appreciate it drop some comments and we'll interact with you and we'll become friends thanks so much uh, stick with us for part three uh, here in about a week, we'll dive into the winds in our test plot basic basics. God bless, and I hope you and your family have a blessed and wonderful day. So cold out there today. I saw a, a member of Congress with his hands in his own pockets. Yeah, I know. <laughs>